Greetings and salutations and thank you for clicking on the video. This is an Easy Linux community update and we're going to call this one for April 2017. It is the last day of March and it is a rainy Friday morning when I record this so you may hear the rain tapping on the windows in the background. You may also hear the construction that's going on down the street. It seems that every time lately that I start doing one of these they crank up some backloader with a beeper on it or whatever. I don't know how much of that you can hear but I can hear it pretty good. Anyhow, this video is going to be me going back through some of the things that I have posted on Facebook and posted on YouTube over the last month or two and I'm going to give you some insight on those topics, give you a little feedback and answer some questions along the way. And also I want to talk a little bit about some of the other things that are available in the Easy Linux community. We got a lot of new subscribers lately. Not too long ago I posted a video where I was thanking folks when we got to the 25,000 mark. We're now over 26,000 so that is totally awesome. So for all of you who are new to the community and watching this video, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. So we're going to take a look at the Facebook page first and Easy Linux has a Facebook page and I encourage you to go check it out. Now I know that some of you guys out there don't like Facebook. You don't want to use Facebook. I know. I understand. It's, you know That's your choice. Go right ahead. But if you are somebody who uses Facebook, be sure to give this page a like. And anytime that something cool comes up that talks about Linux or relates to it, I try and post it here. It's not just stuff that I create, but other things that I find going on in the Linux world that I think maybe you guys might be interested in will pop up here as well. One of the reasons that I do Facebook, for those of you who are such Facebook haters, is because this is where people who are not necessarily Linux people, they this is where they hang out. Okay, People in the Linux community tend to live in their own little bubble and they tend to have a little bit of tunnel vision and they use the services that are used within the community. Well, people who don't use Linux, hey, they use Facebook and a whole big part of the whole easy Linux thing is to reach out to people who don't know what Linux is or know a lot about it so therefore you gotta go where they are gang so let's scroll down through here uh, first thing that I posted earlier this morning was new Linux Thursday from uh, Brian Lunduke and Matt Hartley Matt Hartley of course I work with him on freedompenguin.com we'll talk a little bit about freedom penguin toward the end of the video I'll give you an update on what's going on over there and they have started to do a new show together uh, the Lunduk hour has been out for a while and so therefore I shared that because we've been talking a lot about podcasts lately the other day I had the first client call using the new Skype web client okay I didn't have to use an installed application I just went to the site and logged in and made it work and actually worked quite well my only complaint with that is that the audio quality on the web client is nowhere near as good as it is if you're using the local application so that's my one problem with it so far but for what I do it works fine and once again, this is another situation where a lot of Linuxy type people jumped on it and said, well, Skype sucks. I don't like Skype. Skype's getting ready to die. Who cares about Skype? Why are you worrying with Skype? Skype should go to hell. Well, the people who are Windows refugees, those who have used Microsoft Windows and that's all they know, this is what they know. They know Skype. They don't know a whole lot about other services. They don't know a whole lot about Google Hangouts. They don't know about the other things out there. This is what they know how to use. So if I'm working with somebody who's interested in Linux, nine times out of ten, if they don't want to talk on the phone, they're going to talk on Skype. So I've got to have the ability to use it. So that's why I'm using it right here. And I pointed that out in the comments. It works quite well. It's okay. The audio quality sucks, though. That's the only problem that I had with it. So then they show pictures, and we go pan down past that. I really don't like the fact that Facebook is doing it this way, because they they you're go, you're scrolling down through the page, and then it gets oh well we're going to show all the photos and videos that are shared on the page. It's like okay no just do the posts. So this video I posted is from a fellow named Photonic Induction, and it has nothing to do with Linux. People ask me all the time. 
what do you watch on YouTube? The, the God's honest truth is I don't watch a lot of Linux videos. I watch a few. There are a few people that I follow, but the truth of the matter is when I'm on YouTube, I'm looking for other entertainment. And my training is in radio and electrical engineering. So I actually watch a lot of channels that have to do with that. So I watch Photonic Induction. There's another fellow named Bob Anderson. He does a great YouTube channel where he restores television sets from the early 50s and the late 40s, really early American TV sets, radios from the 20s and 30s, that sort of thing. I spend a lot of time on his channel because I really enjoy his videos. And uh, it's all about tubes and wires and capacitors and trying to get these old things to run. That's just what I'm into. So Brian Lunduk uh, announced the new Linux day, which is Thursday on his channel. So therefore I shared that. And also uh, Noah from the Linux Action Show is starting a new show over on Jupiter Broadcasting. It's called Ask Noah. I think that's going to be really cool. And this all goes back to the fact that the Linux Action Show is going away. They have decided they're going to retire that. And if you've been around the Linux community for a long time, that's been the king. That's been the place to go to find out what's happening, to get the news and, you know, all that stuff. And they've decided that they're going to phase it out. And so, therefore, that's why there's all this stuff about podcasts up here and sharing other people's stuff. It's just simply because... The Linux Action Show is going away. I try really hard not to comment too much on other people's content on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of it out there that I don't like. And so I just take my own advice and I say, well, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. But these guys, for a long time, they were the king. So that's why I'm giving them so much attention. Uh, we had a lovely time. What was it? Last Saturday? me and my brother installing the uh, latest Linux Mint 18.1 XFCE on his second computer. He already uses Linux Lite on his ancient Dell Dimension 3000, and he got a hold of a laptop. So we ended up getting into this thing. Uh, he's in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, so we did it by phone, and I kind of helped him through it. He had some problems with the networking on that computer, but we got it done, and we got it installed, and it actually turned out really well. And that's the first time that I have played with Linux Mint, the XFCE flavor of it, in a long time. And I was really impressed. And he wanted XFCE because he's so used to using Linux Lite, and Linux Lite has the XFCE desktop. So I figured, hey, let's do this. And uh, the computer that he got is more than capable of running Mint. So therefore, I said, why don't you give this a try? And it worked out well. And we got it all set up for him there. So that was kind of a fun experience. And then I did throw uh, Linux Mint XFCE into a virtual machine. Actually, while I was helping him so I could play with it. Really good job from the Linux Mint folks. Works quite well. The problem that I'm having with Linux Mint 18 lately is that when you try and do the updates, when you first install it, that updater ends up trashing the cache. It's done it two or three times in two or three different places lately. And you just have to kind of work your way through it. You just got to poke at it. But once you get all the updates in, then it works fine. So I don't know what's up with that. But that's kind of always been a little little niggly thing with Linux Mint anyway, is that updater when you first install. And then it wants you to go install all the updates. And then you try and do a kernel upgrade or whatever it is. It, sometimes it just gets real confused and it ends up trashing the entire apt system <laughs> and so you have to go back and you have to fix it i don't know whether it's something i'm doing wrong or whether it's meant to tell you the god's honest truth but we got it worked out and it was working fine so if you like the xfce desktop that's a really nice implementation right there i went through a period of time not too long ago where youtube just suddenly for n no reason that i could figure out decided that they weren't going to send me any email updates for new comments that came in on the videos and that's the way I do it that's my workflow is that I check my email and I look for your comments on YouTube through there and if it's something that I need to respond to then I click reply and it jumps over to the video and I can answer it and it just quit working and I poked at this thing for about two days and I couldn't get it to do anything so I finally just left it alone and all of a sudden yesterday morning I sat down and now I'm getting the 
the notifications again. So that's great. But in that period of time, I was having to go to the YouTube channel and use the little bell notifier. And I was also looking on the community page and all that stuff. So if I miss something, I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, it was just that kind of went crazy for a while. It's working now and I don't have any clue why, but there you go. It's just something that Google did, but it's all working. So I posted this thing about podcasting and it's an article on Freedom Penguin and it's also a video. This video has gotten very few views so far. I think the last time I looked at it, it was like 800, but I don't really care. The reason why I did it was because uh, going back to what I was talking about, there's a lot of talk lately about the podcasts around Linux, YouTube, that sort of thing. And I kind of wanted to put out there my experiences with that and also to share with you some of the knowledge that I bring to the internet from traditional radio and television. I worked in radio and TV for 20 years. It's been 10 years now since I've set foot in a radio or television station, but there was a lot of things that I learned from doing that. And so therefore I've brought a lot of that to doing these kind of videos here. And so I wanted to put some of that stuff out there and lay out some guidelines. When I was in radio, I started out as a little bitty baby DJ just doing part-time stuff, part-time engineering. And when I left, I was an operations manager. And so therefore, I used to do a lot of training, a lot of staff training, and also used to give a few lectures here and there at different schools on communication. So it's something that I'm very familiar with. When I did that video, I realized that I was doing a class that I had actually done years and years and years and years ago, just kind of modified it a little bit for the internet. So it was very familiar material. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check it out here on the YouTube channel or go to freedompenguin.com. There's a little bit more in the Freedom Penguin article. And so let's see here. We have a, a video I did not too long ago about partitions and swap and uh, fragmentation. And this was because uh, I have done a few videos in the past where I had mentioned this stuff and people were asking about it. So I posted this one and it just goes through kind of working with hard drives and block storage on your system. And, and then I tried to do a video. I thought, well, maybe it would be a good idea to update an old video that I did like a couple years ago now about adding a new hard drive to a Linux computer. And I tried really hard to do this video and I just couldn't make it work. It was one of those things where I'd click on something and it would crash and it was like, never mind, I gave up. So you can check this one out. And a lot of people ask about that. How do I add a hard drive to a Linux machine? And it's a little bit more difficult to do, especially if you're a newbie and you don't quite understand how Linux works with block storage devices and hard drives. Once you get that in your head, though, you figure out how Linux works with things like that. It becomes quite easy and then it's super flexible and you can just sit there and you can have all kinds of weird storage options on your machine. So you can check that video out if you like. And more Brian and Matt. This is more about partitioning and just some stuff that I was playing around with. I gave XFS a shot on my on a partition on my hard drive. Right now, the machine that I'm doing this video on, I've got one big Western Digital Caviar Black drive on it. And I'm trying to figure out ways to like make VirtualBox go faster and stuff like that. And so for a little while, I was using XFS in the partition for the virtual machine. So I took all the virtual machines, set them aside, and was using XFS. And XFS, for those of you who don't know, is a file system that's available for your Linux machine. And it usually lives on great big servers with big data arrays and stuff like that. So I put it on the this machine here. And it um, yeah made it go a little bit faster, but to tell you the truth, it wasn't worth the effort because XFS tends to use a little bit more CPU. So it was sort of like half dozen and one, six of the other. And it didn't really help with overall performance. So I'm back to EXT4 everywhere now. Now, what would really, what would really be hot is if I would put another hard drive in the machine and then put XFS on that and then put the VMs on that. But with this old machine right now, I'm trying to keep things as simple as possible. So I have one drive in it. As a bunch of VMs running because I've been working a lot with virtual machines lately. I thought this was really funny. This picture is really clear. <laughs> it's like, yo, dog, I heard you like Linux, so you can put some Linux in your Linux. That's kind of cute. 
effective communications, uh, more about that. That was kind of a subject we were going through. Now, this is a story about Firefox. Firefox came out with a, a revision of 52 that they decided that they were no longer going to be using the Netscape style plugins anymore. So Java went poof. And a lot of the reason why I was keeping Firefox around uh, for a long time, I ran Firefox and Chrome together. And a lot of the reason why I was doing that just went away. It was like, there's no reason to keep Firefox around. Uh, so therefore I have purged Firefox from my life. It only runs on virtual machines. And I have also deleted my Firefox sync account. I have no intention whatsoever of using the browser. Uh, it's just simply because Google Chrome does what I need it to do. And I've always been a Chrome guy. Now, if you like Firefox, that's fine. And if the fact that they drop Java and the other Netscape plugins doesn't bother you, cool. Matter of fact, they just announced that they have finally added Netflix support to Firefox. So if you are one of those people that kept Chrome around just because you used the Netflix service and it didn't work in Firefox, well, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You can go ahead and dump Chrome if you want to. But me personally, I'm kind of done with Firefox. And that's just my personal choice. Whatever browser you like is fine. I know I've got a lot of clients on Firefox. My mom just loves Firefox. That's that's the browser for her. And let's see here. It was um, go back down here. We took a look at Linux Lite, the latest 3.2, and it went quite well in a virtual machine. But I did run into some issues, and one of them was the fact that it doesn't really like UEFI. So if you try and load this on a computer that has UEFI enabled, uh, Linux Lite will just kind of stare at you. It won't even boot. So they haven't, either there's something wrong with it or they just don't have UEFI support native to Linux Lite. It is intended to run on older, slower hardware. So that would make sense. They probably don't need to worry about it. So if you want to use it, you can just turn UEFI off. I also found out from working with my brother that um, Linux Lite doesn't find some drivers off the bat that you need. But once again, we were trying to install that on a... Well, that's not true. We were actually trying to install it on a slightly older machine. Not old, old, but it couldn't find the drivers for the Wi-Fi, whereas Linux Mint did. So, not putting it down. I'm just saying that's what I dealt with when I was trying to put it on another machine not too long ago. And here's more about VirtualBox and XFS. Uh, OpenSUSE, I downloaded the alpha for OpenSUSE 42.3, which is not going to be out until July. And I had that running in a virtual machine, and I've been goofing around with it. And I finally completely trashed it, and it wouldn't boot, so I've deleted it. I'm going to wait until 42.3 is actually released. And then we might do a video about it. OpenSUSE, to me, is just kind of weird. And I'm not really good with the, the system, so I ended up destroying it, trying to do some other stuff with it, and trying to learn about it. But I'll check in with it later. Beginner's Guide to the Bash Terminal. I posted this not too long ago. This video has gotten a lot of really good attention. And here is the article that goes along with it on freedompenguin.com. And the idea behind that video was just for me to actually do, take like an hour and give you the very basic stuff that you need to actually start using a Bash Terminal. And so if that's something that you're interested in, I strongly advise you to check that out because there's a lot of great information about getting started with issuing commands to the command line in a bash terminal, Linux, then, but it's all kind of divided up. It's like there's wonderful things on YouTube. Even I did a series not too long ago that runs like two or three hours long where I went through and went into minute detail on everything. And I thought, well, what if you just want to crash course? You just want to know, you just want to get enough to know what you're doing. That's what this video is. So if that's something you're interested in, be sure and check it out. And people who go, well, you got to use the terminal. Just talk to the hand. I don't care. I don't want to hear it. The terminal is a huge part of Linux. And Bash is a universal way of talking to all kinds of computers. Yeah, my thank you video had five dislikes on it for the 25,000 subscribers. I couldn't, believe, I couldn't believe that. I was like, why would you dislike me thanking people? But anyway, YouTube is YouTube. I'm sure there's going to be lots of dislikes on this video. I swear to God, there are people who are subscribed to this channel that come along just to dislike it. That's all they do. 
They see a video pops up, they dislike it, and they move on. More power to you. You can go ahead and waste your energy if you want to. I don't mind, but it just kind of <laughs> struck me funny, man. Okay, let's see. Load more stuff. Why are you being slow? More about Firefox going away that I had purged it out of my life. 25,000 subscribers can't be wrong. And let's see here. Yeah, this is all about Firefox. This is a picture a friend of mine posted to me. His uh, work computer came up with a blue screen of death. I thought it was kind of cool looking on dual monitors because he's got a work computer that runs Windows. And uh, Brian Linduk says he's going to do the last Linux Sucks video. So there you go. So let me see if there's any more here that's kind of worth going back over. It's just been kind of quiet since the beginning of the year. Uh, somebody asked me how to multi-boot Linux distributions. So I did a video about that. If you have a computer and you just can't decide, like you want one, you know, this one guy said, well, I'm using Linux Mint and I like it for this reason and I'm using Ubuntu Mate and I like it for that reason on different machines and I'd kind of like to put them both on there. So I did a video showing you how you could do that. And the thing is, is that I'm not a big fan of dual booting anything. I think that really an operating system it should be one machine one operating system I don't care which one you choose as long as it's just that because when you start putting more than one operating system on a machine things can get a little weird especially if you're trying to boot Windows and Linux at the same time so not a big fan of that and you have to really be a computer expert to make that work but I did do a video about that if you'd like to check it out some funnies there Eh, beginner's Guide to Bash. Some hardware came along that's uh, featuring Linux. Speaking of hardware, I have been trying to uh, figure out what I'm going to do with my hardware situation. I had posted earlier, like way back, that I wanted to buy a new machine. But right now, I, my strategy is this machine that I'm doing this video on is running on Ubuntu 14.04. And it works perfectly. This old Dell loves it. All my old hardware right now is running Linux Mint 17.3 or Ubuntu 14.04. It just seems to me that when they moved, when Ubuntu moved to the 4.4 kernel, it don't work with all this old junk. So until I get a new machine, that's exactly what I'm going to stay with. Of course, anything works in a virtual machine. So that's my personal strategy right now. I do not plan to be doing any hardware-based distro hopping. I tried a bunch of stuff here. More about uh, KD Neon came up because I gave that a shot not too long ago. And, I, you know, I'm not a KDE hater gang. I really am not. Uh, how to customize your bash environment. That's just basically working with your bash RC file. Did something on that. Uh, how to use MP3 gain from the command line. That's a program that I've talked a lot about that for those of you who have large music collections and you actually have MP3 files. Now, I'm not talking about MP3 files in a general term. I'm talking about MP3 files themselves. That's a great little application to have around. You might want to check that out. And that video was by request. And this is my Freedom Penguin review of Linux Mint 18.1, which I think is really an awesome version of Linux Mint. I think we've gone back pretty much as far as I want to go looking at these different things. Just uh, some different stuff. Um, I do plan on doing a review video on Ubuntu 17.04. And I have mentioned that in a past video that I have this running and I have the, uh, the beta running right now in a virtual machine. And I just go in and update it every now and again. But I am not going to say a word about another release of Ubuntu until it is fully released. I got bit real bad with 16.04 last year because I posted a lot of videos and I was talking about the the beta release of it. And when they actually came out with the standard release, it's like officially here, yay! A lot of stuff went to hell real fast. That's when the Wi-Fi bug showed up. There were driver issues that popped up. It was like that last update that made it the complete 16.04 and everything that just went crazy 
So I kind of left egg on my face because I was sitting there going, oh, this is the greatest Ubuntu in the world, but yet it was all screwed up. So guess what? I'm going to wait. When 1704 comes along, I will do a big long video. We'll talk about all the changes in it, and that's when it is officially released. We will do that. And for some reason, my page up button isn't working. So I was going to try and go back up to the top of the page, but who cares? So I'm sitting here just scrolling along while I'm talking. So a couple other things to talk about. That's kind of what we've been doing lately, and that's the idea here is that anything that comes along, anything I post, it's all going to end up on Facebook. So if you're a Facebook user, jump on. This is where a lot of the action is these days. Let's talk about Freedom Penguin. FreedomPenguin.com is a web page that is designed for people that have a very practical attitude toward Linux and they use it every day. You don't necessarily have to be a server geek and you are not somebody who's a hobbyist. Of course, if you're a hobbyist, you're going to get something out of it. But really, this page is aimed at people who use Linux as their daily system at home, maybe in their small business. A lot of great stories pop up here. I got one right here that's uh, well, actually one that I want to read here. <laughs> Does Adobe hate Linux? That's a really good question. Uh, so I, I talked to Matt and he said that you know, it would be okay to put the effective communication and podcasting here, try and get it out a little bit. If you see that article or if you see that video, share it for me because that's not one I know that a lot of people who are looking for Linux information are going to be interested in. It's kind of slightly off topic, but I do kind of want to get that out there and just see if I could share a little bit of that knowledge from my days in broadcasting. Somebody came back to me and asked me about that and they said, the one thing you didn't say is that you should always talk to one person. That's an old cliche from radio and television. Always imagining you're talking to just one person. I never did completely buy that. I think the best thing to do is to talk to the one person in the audience who is most interested in what you have to say, which is different from picturing that you're talking to your grandma or whatever the deal is. You know what I mean? So anyway, uh, do check out the Freedom Penguin page. You will find a link to it in the description for this video. I think this is something you guys, especially those of you who are newcomers, you will enjoy. I contribute articles here on a semi-regular basis. A lot of people do. And, of course, Matt Hartley, he contributes as well. And Matt Hartley, has, he's a Linux guru going way, way back. He's been around the community for a long, long time. These are the Linux good guys over here, gang. So that's why I'm always talking about them on my channel. And we're talking about just using Linux in a practical way every day. It's not about politics. It's not about telling people that, well, if you use this distribution, then you're an idiot. Uh, the Linux community, there's a lot of that that goes on in a lot of other Linux, you know, Linux media content, articles, YouTube, podcasts. And it tends to be rather, I don't know, uh, to me it comes across as being elitist is the best way to put it. It's that it's kind of a an elitist crowd there. That, well, if you don't use this distribution, then you must be an idiot. And it's like, no, use whatever works for you. That's my attitude. So, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Cyber Web Solutions website as well. Jeremy O'Connell with Cyber Web Solutions is, is a very good friend of the Easy Linux community, and he is the person right now that I am sending people to who ask questions about small business applications and also about servers. So I actually get a lot of people who ask those questions. They go, well, I need to set up this server or I need to do that. I'm a desktop guy. I do desktop Linux. People who are using it at home, maybe a very small business application like a home business. But if you want to know more about setting up servers and things like that, this is right up Jeremy Street. This is what he does. And so therefore, I've been sending folks over there. And also, I wanted to bring up Jeremy because we are planning on doing another Mr. Desktop and Mr. Server podcast in the not-too-distant future. The one that we did not too long ago about SSH and the different tools that you can use around that networking. That has gotten a lot of great feedback and the next one we're going to do and i'm going to announce it and then wait for the flames here because here it comes <laughs> i mean the hate mail is going to come rolling in but our subject next time around is going to be working with system d we're going to talk about system d 
and how you can put that to use and make it do things for you. I think it's going to be kind of an interesting podcast, and I don't think it's going to be as long as the last one was. The last one ran like two and a half hours, and I realize, gang, that's an insane length. But we had a lot to cover in there. We could have done that in a series, I guess, but we ended up just doing it all in one shot because Jeremy's a busy person, and so therefore we have to really work on when he can block out time to do this, I like to take advantage of it so I can pick his brain because he knows more about that side of Linux than I do, working with servers and things like that. So I always like to you know, take advantage of him when I got him. It's like, okay, talk. <laughs> Just tell us what you know, man, because he's a really smart guy. But the next one shouldn't be quite that long because we're going to talk about working with init systems and system D. And of course, these videos are for people who are more advanced users. And we just like to try and talk about things that aren't getting a lot of talk. Like we did the whole thing about the SSH and SSHFS and SFTP and all those different programs. We did that because in the Linux community, when they start talking about networking, you hear about Samba, you hear about NFS. And it's like, whoa, wait a minute, hold on. All this stuff is built into the system. All you got to do is learn how to use it. So that's what that was about. So I'm showing you the Cyber Web Solutions site. I will put that link in the description of this video as well. And you can go check it out and you can contact Jeremy if you would like to have him help you with uh, something that is more you know, geeky like and more enterprise based than just how do I get Linux Mint installed because that's what I concentrate on. And finally, before we wrap this up, I want to talk about EasyLinux.com. And one of the things that I wanted to point out was is that the Contact Us page on EasyLinux.com, that is a really good way to get a hold of me because it will send me an email and then I will be able to get back in touch with you and there's one caveat here and I've had this happen with two or three people lately is that when you send me a message here I'm going to respond to you with email and it's going to be an email that comes from easylinux.com so it will be like info at easylinux.com so if you send something here and you don't hear anything from me check your spam folder because some people end up getting that thrown directly into the spam folder and then they never see it. And then they think, well, this guy, Joe, he's a jerk. He, he, I sent him an email and he didn't respond to me. I try and respond to everything that comes in through this right here. If you send me something from here, I will respond to it. But make sure that you are looking for the response in your spam folder if it doesn't show up in your inbox because... Especially Gmail. Gmail's just real happy to throw my emails into the people's spam folders. Email's a big pain in the butt, gang. I'm telling you. It really is hard to deal with these days because people have screwed it up so bad with all the spam and and there's all these blacklists out there and you know, you try and just make it um, of course I will never spam you. And if you send by the way, I don't keep any of your information at all. Whatever you tell me I don't hang on to. The only thing that I hang on to is a contact. So if we have a conversation by email, then I do keep your email address in my contacts in case you ever I have to send you something back later. But as far as like putting those in some sort of quantified list and selling your stuff, and I don't do nothing. And if you share something with me, it's a little bit, you know, like a phone number that we decided we're going to do a, a phone call. I do not keep that information. I don't. I destroy pretty much all the emails that I get immediately they go into the trash and they're gone and that way uh, I just don't want I don't want people to think that I'm fishing for information because I absolutely am not so yeah if you have a if you're a client and we haven't talked in six months and then you send me an email and say give me a call I'll probably ask for your phone number again I didn't keep it it's gone so <laughs> that way it's it's semi-anonymous I hang on to information long enough that it's useful and then once I don't need to talk to you on a regular basis again it just goes poof so I just wanted to put that out there and uh, another thing that we've been talking about with Easy Linux I've rambled on this long is and you know probably the guys who are actually listening to me talk at this point you guys are really hardcore so one of the things that we have kinda kicked around is the idea of having a forum where people can get information and we can post things about uh, you know hardcore kind of stuff people who are working with their systems and and we could do like an easy linux forum and and those of you who are 
really hip to how the system works, you might want to be a part of that. That's an idea that we're working with right now. And we will probably do that after we get the site secured. Right now, Easy Linux, when you go to it, it's just HTTP. There's no certificate. Uh, it's not a big deal at this point because there's not a whole lot of interaction with the site going on. But when we were looking at doing some different things for hosting in a couple months here, and when we do that, we might put up a forum because one of the things that we definitely want to do is secure the site. If you're going to be coming to the site and you're going to be sending information to it, then I want it to be secure. Right now, it really doesn't matter, but that's coming up down the road. So that's an idea that we're kicking around is maybe starting a forum and having a place for uh, more discussion about Linux. I mean, we got Facebook now. We've got this going on on YouTube, and we've got uh, easylinux.com where you can contact me directly. But we may even go one step further with that. So if you, those of you who are hearing me say that, since we're way down toward the end of the video, uh, you might want to send me some feedback. Let me know what you think about that and how you'd want that laid out. Of course, I would want it to, to be a very well-moderated forum. Make sure that we didn't get any nastiness on there, no trolling. I'm not big into that, but you know, a forum with useful information of some sort. So that's an idea we're kicking around. We'll probably work on that a little bit. So needless to say, this uh, Easy Linux community thing is growing by leaps and bounds. It's pretty awesome. And I just really have enjoyed interacting with all of the people who are coming on here. I think the I think the Linux community in general is changing. I think for many years it could very well have been argued that the Linux community was in two basic camps. You had hobbyists and then on the other side of it you had people who were doing servers, enterprise level stuff. And now there seems to be this lovely group of people that's developing in the middle. Matter of fact on Brian Lunduke's uh, podcast, they were talking about just this, is that there's these, they, he called them the makers. These are people who want to use a computer to produce something. I don't even see it as that. I think that there are some people out there, but I also think there are mature, intelligent people out there who want control of their computer. And they realize that living in a walled garden like Mac or living in the wild, wild west like what happens with Windows with all the malware and viruses and everything that goes on on that platform that Linux offers a safe haven for people who just want to sit down in front of their computer and have it work and if you pick a distribution like good old Ubuntu here or Linux Mint which is the one that most people ask about then you're not going to have to worry about will my machine work the next time I use it am I going to have to sit here and spend a half hour installing some stupid update before I get to use my computer no Linux makes it very simple. I'll give you a good for instance on that. My mom, she ran Windows for years. She didn't even touch a computer until she was about 68 years old. She started out with Windows and then I switched her over to Linux. It's been almost a couple of years ago now. And since she's gone to Linux, she has started actually doing things with her computer. She does a lot of genealogy and historical stuff. And she's on all these different websites and she's generating all these documents and she's scanning in you know, stuff from books and uh, all kinds of crazy stuff. She never did any of that when she was on Windows because she was literally afraid of the computer. She was afraid that she would break it. Now that she's on Linux and I said, oh, just here's how you do the updates and this is how you do that. And oh, if you don't want to install the updates, you don't have to. They can wait. So if you're in the middle of something, you look down, you see you got updates. No big deal. Put it off until you're done. All of that has just really empowered her to be able to do what she wants to do. And she's not a computer expert by any stretch of the imagination. I think there are a lot of people out there who are coming to Linux who fit that category. They just want a machine. When they sit, First of all, they need a real computer. They don't want to use a Chromebook because it's not everything they do is in the cloud and they want local storage and they don't want to give all their information to Google in the process. They don't want to spend the money for a Mac and they don't want to deal with the problems that the Mac people are having. And then, of course, for Windows for them is a nightmare because click on the wrong thing and the next thing you know your, your system's trashed. So what they really want is just a nice, friendly, freedom-respecting system that lets them do what they want to do. Linux is giving that to them, which is awesome. So that is really cool. So I think that uh, kind of what 
Matt and Brian are doing right now, freedompenguin.com, Easy Linux, a few other people out there on the web. They really represent this new breed of Linux user. They're not geeks. They're not hobbyists. They just want a system that works. And, of course, it certainly helps if you're curious. A lot of the people that I work with are very curious about the system. They want to learn more. We may start out using Linux Mint, but I kind of know, well, maybe this they'll do something else later. I mean, if they decide that they want to dive into Arch Linux and make that their daily driver, hey, you know, but they got to start somewhere. And Linux Mint is an excellent place to start. So is Ubuntu Mate. And there's a lot of distros out there that are designed to be easy to use and designed to be stable. So this this is the new breed of user. We are, I don't know, call them the neophytes if you want to. <laughs> the new people, they're not people who have grown up with computer science or servers. They're just people who want a machine that works. And they want something more than a tablet or a Chromebook or a smartphone. They want a computer. I think that's awesome. Thanks for watching the video, gang. I really appreciate it. And do check out the links down in the description. Might find something really cool there. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for watching.